we want to talk about what actually caused the end for Mitt Romney and his campaign. So we welcome to the studio Alan Kelly, CEO and founder of Playmaker Systems. The website is PlaymakerSystems.com. He tweets at Playmaker Alan, that's A-L-A-N, and is writing about the final analysis, why Obama won, Romney beat Romney, and so forth and so on, and labels, et cetera. So welcome back. Good morning. I don't know if it's a final visit, but I, I certainly wanted to get your take on the plays that won the presidency and maybe if there were any particular ones that stood out to you, because all along we had been talking about different plays that were working or not working, but clearly with President Obama winning, and by a pretty substantial margin, there had to be some things that stuck out to you that that either were great plays that he ran or plays that Mitt Romney ran poorly. Great question. I, well, I think of that, course. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, Mitt Romney, I think, uh, relied heavily on a play that we call a call-out. It's, okay. very, it's very much to, uh, if you can imagine it as you drive down the road, on the right side of this spectrum of 24 uh, plays or influence strategies. I think he was trying to, uh, you know, obviously call out, uh, you know, the, the economy and tie, and, and tie uh, Obama to that. And that was a fairly, um, you know, straightforward uh, play. The problem is that he, he ran out of, if, if you're going to call somebody out, whether in a in a puerile way or some constructive way, you got to have something else coming, and he tended not to. Later, you know, late in the campaign, he tended not to have the answer that that he was implying that that Obama should have. And so, I think in that that in that regard, that was a, a real failure to understand influence strategy. Mm. One of the things that struck me and that people have talked about is the ability of the president to label Mitt Romney or recast, if you will. This was early on in the campaign. He managed to make him something that Mitt Romney did not want to be known as, and something that actually Newt Gingrich had started during the primary season. That was to call him the, well, he didn't use the word, but the rapacious capitalist, the man who took his money and put it in Cayman uh, secret accounts, and he had Swiss bank accounts, and he was exporting jobs. He was um, a pioneer in uh, outsourcing jobs to China. All of these labels that the Obama campaign threw at Mitt Romney, seems like some of that stuck. I think it did. Um, you know, he was very good at uh, labeling him, as we say from Silicon Valley, a vulture capitalist, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a job killer. And, and he had demonstrable proof points uh, uh, behind that. And those were difficult things for, uh, it was difficult for Romney to, you know, peel off those labels. So yeah, he was, he was a, he was a good label uh, labeler. I think in general, you know, as, as, as we started this conversation, what, six months ago and looking at it now, uh, we, we predicted then it sort of makes sense now that, that Obama was, or is the better, uh, play caller. He has. We know this. Certainly we, more we, agile too. Absolutely. We, we plot this against our system, and we and it's just clear that he runs and is more familiar with and is more facile with plays, uh, and that uh, and Romney, by contrast, is a much more narrow uh, footprint. And you could say at best that that's maybe because he's more disciplined. Uh, but you know, I, I think from my perspective, you know, I I fully expected. Uh, at most points uh, for for uh, Obama to win this because. Elections are all about influence strategy. To me, that's the base discipline uh, behind or beneath all of this. And so he who is the better master of that should win. And he did win. But there were points, though, in the campaign where you had the feeling that uh, Obama was ambivalent about the job, that he didn't suffer any of this well. First debate in Denver, for example. Absolutely. Uh, And you bring bring up something. I'm sorry to interrupt, but you bring up something that I think is fascinating. And this is that when people are inside the campaign, in the belly of the beast, as it were, I wonder how much they realize whether or not their strategy is working or whether or not they realize what what is being played. And and it's sort of like there's a difference looking at a battlefield from whether you want to say, you know, an airplane doing surveillance or from the big tower. You can go back years in the past. It was always about trying to get a view of the battlefield because if you're the soldier right there in the middle of things, you can't tell all the time what's going on around you. And I wonder, sometimes you get that group think going on. You're thinking... This momentum is building and there's all of a sudden this move and, and, you know, because we got to Election Day and the results and people thought, how could the Romney people have been so wrong? And I understand there's a bit of spin involved here, but there was an awful high level of sincerity, I thought, with people who thought they had a real good shot at winning. And to see it unravel so tremendously makes you wonder, well, can you develop that kind of strategy when you're that close to it? Do you need some distance? There were a lot of people who thought, for example, that the Obama campaign was going to have a problem. Why? Because they were going to be in Chicago while the White House operation went on in D.C. There was something new about this. And I wonder how much your distance from the battlefield, if you will, makes it 
important or, or if that is a factor in determining um, strategy or an effective strategy? Whether you're a CEO or a Politico. Sure. Um, you know, you, you, it's always in your interest to array yourself with people who are very, very close uh, uh, operationally and very, very distant. And, and I think most of the campaigns... That's a good way of putting most it. Most of the campaigns have that, and I don't know, actually, all about those details. But I, um, I think that certainly uh, they can all get locked into groupthink. Where I saw... Where I saw and where I really believe that Romney beat Romney, you know, uh, to t- take from the political cartoon that was pushed out six months ago in the St. Louis Dispatch that I saw the other day. Um, I don't want to steal the idea, but I, he really did beat himself. And I think it's because he, he was not, it was not so much that he couldn't run plays to use this, this lexicon, but he couldn't counter him. Mm-hmm. He, was not, he was not good at, at prosecuting, prosecuting a point uh, to, in some way that he's been, he'd been accused of doing something wrong. He was not good at, at really ever coming back. Obama is expert at that. Mm-hmm. Obama has not just a, a sense for, but a predilection for diving on bombs, on media memes, and smothering them. You know, he said, I like Obamacare. He would say Muslim. He would say socialist. He would acknowledge Donald Trump, you know, mm-hmm. on late night TV. Romney didn't do that. You know, you take the Clint Eastwood example, you know, when he did his, his, you know, his wandering, um, you know, empty chair monologue, Romney did not understand that that was actually a threat to him. He didn't actually run to try to control that. He sort of let it bloom out of his control. Romney was either naive uh, to what was going on around him or was very stubborn to his plan that he wanted to talk about what he wanted to talk about. And Mm -hmm. markets are never like that. Mm -hmm. Obama, I think it, it was comparably more facile. Let us turn now, and I don't want to make, uh, you know, ignore the election that's over because a lot of this is fascinating. You are writing about it, but we've already had the beginnings now of phase two, which is, okay, the president's been elected. He has to get inaugurated, but we've got a new Congress coming in, and already we've seen Speaker John Boehner and the House Majority Leader Harry Reid get out there. The president today laying out his idea for the markers for moving forward. A lot of this was in the campaign. And so one would assume that one of the things he's going to do is say, look, we have, we have just had this election and this is what the American people say they want. So let's move ahead and do that. So um, look at you pointing to your plays to win. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well to every hammer, everything looks like a nail. There you you know, I, I have a system. It's, you know, it looks like a periodic table if you'd like to go see it. And I think that, uh, you know, I... I I would expect that we'll start to see a, a, a sort of a graduation of influence strategies. I don't mean this politically, but from left to right across our spectrum. Um, the way we've defined it is that if you're in the business of influence, you're always assessing, conditioning, or engaging at the very most basic level. So assess is on the left, conditioning is in the middle, and engaging is on the right. So left to right is a process yes. as opposed yes, to a, a political, political thing. thing. Okay, there we go. Well, good. <laughs> and, uh, um, and so what we saw um, you know, almost immediately... Uh, if no, in fact, immediately, were, were the major players inserting themselves and running what I would call very left-sided plays, very assess-oriented or very low in, low uh, low engagement plays to start a, to start to tee up a discussion or a conversation or a debate to start to outline their side. So we saw trial balloons. Uh, you know, by Reed and by Boehner. We saw the play we've talked a lot about, the ping, which is just the subtle raising of the eyebrow, if you will. We've had, we've seen people start to outline uh, their positions. Those are very low engagement plays, very different from what you see at the end of a process, like three days ago, where there are very right-sided plays, high engagement things like preempts. And we've talked about the Trump and the call out and even the crazy Ivan. Those are way on the other direction. We're not going to see that yet. We might see that come around late, uh, late December. December as we get to, uh, I have a new thought for it, the credit chasm. You're looking for synonyms. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the, the fiscal <laughs> the, the, the fiscal cliff, um, you know, we'll, we'll start to see this. The uh, economic escarpment. Is, uh, I so did like more. escarpment a lot. Yeah, that I was like good. It. Sure. Well, thank you. Yeah. But I, I understand what you're saying. And of course, we, it may be December. They may be that they do something and say, look, let's leave it. I'm already hearing that they're, oh, I'm you know, just, just listening I'm to just the words. Sure of it. Listening to the words, though, they're saying <laughs> that they're, they're already thinking yeah. that they're, they're going to leave this to the next Congress because that's the Congress that was elected by the American people uh, on November the 6th. And they're the people who should be responsible for making these decisions and they'll just sort of make something retroactive. I don't know how it's going to play out. It'll all be fine. But the Redskins will be in the playoffs. But but the point, I guess, part of this is that, yes, the presidential election, the congressional election, the senatorial election, they're all over, and yet the plays continue. Well, sure. Yeah. 
I mean, influence strategy is everywhere. Mm-hmm. It, uh, if you can, you know, if you're in marketing, public relations, advertising, public affairs, lobbying, military information operations, much less politics, you walk around in like a veritable Times Square of influence strategies. It is like radio waves. And and what my work involves is is an attempt to try to identify uh, the the critical bands, if you will, to use electromagnetic spectrum as a as an analogy. I think that I think that we all know we run plays. We all know that we're all trying to influence, whether collaboratively or or quite competitively or confrontationally. But it's we're past due to understand precisely what they are. It's really important at this point for politics as important it is as it is for brand for reputation for all these high-minded, in, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, uh, intangible assets we talk mm-hmm. about, we have to know much more precisely the row and the seat number of what we're doing. Mm-hmm. They're way too important not to know about. And, and clearly you need to have somebody who understands the strategy and can actually lay out a strategy, but also somebody who can execute it and somebody who can adjust to a strategy because you need battlefield commanders. You need people who can adjust to the conditions of the battlefield. That's right. But one of the problems we have in this environment that is that every commander, every every battlefield sort of has their own lexicon. Mm-hmm. They, there are no standard ways yet by which we can figure out how to responsibly teach it, talk about it, be transparent about it. Everyone sort of has their own way of talking about it. That's not okay. Um, you know, that would never work and that would never be okay in the business of accounting hence we have generally accepted accounting principles that would never work in biology hence we have the phylogenetic tree i practice that every day because it's hard to remember <laughs> uh, uh, but you know really that in order for any reason would you like to discuss monera and protista too or do you, <laughs> never mind in, in order for any discipline uh, or practice or field to responsibly advance they have to have they have to have good standard systems they have to be able to concede or to know about at the atomic level Level, what in the world we do or they do. And politics, which is now starting to call itself political management, much less PR, advertising, so on and so forth, needs to know that. They haven't up to this point. And that's why people like me sit and we study the plays, or in this case, the plays of the presidency. I would like to have you come back to as we go along here, uh, maybe from time to time, maybe not every week, but as we go through this whole uh, whatever we're going to do with the, with the fiscal cliff and uh, just get your take on the, the plays that are being run. I hope you'll come back. It's been great having you, though, this whole this whole campaign. Well, let me say how honored I have been uh, to, to, to get to speak about this. And I think that what POTUS does is really important. The mm-hmm. media has been a very important player here. And for you, to, abs- for you to, to attempt to go right down the middle here, I think, has a lot of merit. And I'm honored to be affiliated oh, with well, that. I appreciate that.